was getting at, I would say that this, at that point, after that, the environment at Bell started changing a little bit, right? Would you have gotten into EUV lithography just out of intellectual curiosity? I did. You did? I did. Oh, okay. No one said, do this. Uh, it turns out a colleague of mine who I'd worked with on atomic beam was Rick Freeman. Uh, I think he was a department head, was he not? And, and he had a Murray Hill. Pardon me? It was the department head at Murray Hill. Yeah, yeah Mur oh yeah, he was the department head at Murray Hill. I was at Homedale. Uh, but uh, actually, a lot of our work was done with uh, Rick's atomic beam machine. He'd gotten his PhD using atomic beams. And I had wanted to do some <coughs> atomic beam experiments, but I didn't, didn't know how to build an atomic beam machine. So Rick and I were friends, and we got together and did some nice experiments with his apparatus and my lasers. Uh, anyway, Rick and I and others would run at lunchtime and we were close and collaborated on lots of things. Now, Rick was really an atomic physicist, but for some reason he got the idea he'd like to look at ways of making ever smaller features in lithography, you know, the techniques by which you make integrated circuits. And uh, he formed a group. And uh, I was, I kind of had a short-term view of things. For instance, uh, when we had cooled and trapped atoms, there's a whole plethora of interesting trapping. And in fact, there's tons of research that has come out of cold atoms trapping. That actually sounds like laser cooling. Is that laser what cooling? Nobel Prize for yeah. laser yeah, Steve Chu won the Nobel Prize. He was one of our colleagues. And, and then the bose Einstein condensation ultimately. So this is the precursor yeah. work to all of that. Probably six to nine Nobel Prizes came out of this. Yeah. And, and so Steve, for instance, wanted to continue on in this field, and he did, and he did very well. He became a professor here. I don't know if you knew that. He was a professor at Stanford for a number of years. Uh, <laughs> Steve, you're right. Steve, 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 for some reason, get the seven-year itch. It's time to try something new, and uh, maybe it was a dumb thing to do, but uh, uh, Rick and I were talking about what he was interested in, and I eventually said to him, hey, do you mind if I join your group? And he was kind of like a guest. He said, do you really want to get into this? Because it was very applied as opposed to what we've been doing. Uh, and I said, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I really enjoyed it. It was a totally new field. That meant we had to go around, talk to people who knew more about lithography. So what calendar year was that about? <laughs> I'm really bad. Uh, well, probably, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> probably, probably about 1990, I'd say, approximately. Okay. About 1990. And uh, you know, we learned about all the things you cannot do in lithography. You know, people would say, you will never ever be able to do this. You will never be able to do this. I mean, you won't do it because you couldn't do it. You won't do it because it will ruin the circuits, or it's too expensive, or it's just stupid. And uh, it's, it's very interesting because as, as lithography goes on, it turns out if there's not something else available, they'll do these things that are stupid, too expensive, or will never work. They're going to make them work because there's nothing else to do. Uh, and uh, so Rick's idea was really very foresightful. How can we, our goal was to print one mic, 10 micron features having a working distance of one micron. In other words, how accurately would you have to focus on your wafer? One micron <coughs> seemed like pushing it, but possible. And the tenth micron was way beyond what people were doing that current uh, at that current time. And uh, so we started thinking about that. And eventually it dawned on me that there was a kind of interesting chart you could make, you know. Uh, the uh, resolution is determined partly by the numerical aperture of the system and the wavelength of the light. <clears throat> and as you decrease the wavelength of the light, you can get finer and finer features. And on the other hand, the 
depth of focus is related, once again, to numerical aperture and the wavelength, except it goes the other direction. And so you get a little top triangle diagram and basically says your wavelength has to be shorter than a certain amount in order to get both this resolution and the depth of focus simultaneously. And right away we say, whoops. <laughs> this puts us into the uh, extreme ultraviolet or soft x-ray part of the spectrum. We said, wow, what are we going to do there? You know, nothing transmits light. So we're going to have to, if, if you want to work there, you're going to have to use mirrors. But it's very hard to reflect very short wavelength light. But there was one band where there uh, had been research and people learned how to get reflectivities of about 60%. And it turned out that little band was just inside the, the margin or around 13 nanometer wavelength, which would say soft x-ray. And so we started researching how in the world are you going to do this if it isn't even possible. And as things went on, it looked like it was more and more possible, but pretty far out. And it uh, turns out we weren't the only ones to think of this. Uh, people at Lawrence Livermore Labs had thought about it. Uh, and then we started getting collaborations with them, Sandia National Laboratory and Lawrence Berkeley Labs. And pretty soon industry got involved. Uh, well, actually, initially, IBM, Bell Labs, and several other big research groups were really pushing this. But uh, around that time, the Bell system got broken up. Uh, funding for Bell Labs went down like crazy. Basically, I would say Bell Labs was falling apart. And uh, Intel, among others, could say, wow, uh, no one's going to pursue this. And uh, Intel wanted to get in on the game to see if there was something that they could do. Uh, eventually, Bell Labs fell apart so much, I said, I'm going to take early retirement. Can you just uh, explain a little bit about that? I, I missed that. Was it a very painful thing? What, well, did, it, did it occur overnight? Did no, 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 no. It did not occur overnight. So Bell Labs, was, uh, at and was broken up. The funding went down. Um, and I think the development areas were the first to feel the crunch. Or at least that's my perspective. And so while some parts of Bell Labs were definitely cutting back, it seemed to me that the influence on research, because we were probably a small fraction, this is something, okay, people think of Bell Labs as being the research group, but actually the research group was a small fraction of the entirety of Bell Labs. Okay. Uh, Bell Labs' primary focus was engineering telephone system communications. Uh, so the research was a relatively small fraction. And, and so I think the other parts of Bell Labs were the first to feel the crunch. Uh, but there was a little bit more push for research to be a little bit more relevant. Uh, but uh, people saw the handwriting on the wall, and a lot of people uh, started leaving all the left before that. I left because I didn't like it. 